Uh, hello everyone, I am Elias aka The Herbal Scientist and we are here today with Phil Trabshow who is a licensed acupuncturist, traditional herbal medicine practitioner. You've also practiced cupping, two in massage and something that I'm very interested in because I know very little, uh, moxibustion. So welcome Phil and tell us a few things about yourself that I missed in my short intro. Hey folks, um, hey Elias, thanks for the great introduction. Um, so my name's Phil, I'm working in Manchester in the UK at the moment. I've uh, been practicing acupuncture, well studying acupuncture for 10 years now, uh, just this month since I started my acupuncture journey. Um, and yeah, I've been gradually developing that, integrating um, Chinese herbal medicine into my practice over the past couple of years. Um, and yeah, quite a, quite a busy life trying to be an acupuncturist and herbalist. So, um, but yeah, thoroughly enjoy it. Very cool. Um, but yeah, you said about being interested in moxibustion. Yeah, because I know very little. And okay. I, know, I know about, um, I know about the plant, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm not really aware of what the practice of moxibustion uh, contains like I know about mugwort, but yeah. I, I don't know how you you use it uh, as as like um, burning. Yeah. Okay. So it's um it's quite an odd practice, moxibustion. I mean, it's essentially you take the plant, um, the mugwort plant, and it's the um, the down off the back of the leaves. Mm -hmm. So really, it's got to be fairly high grade for it to work. Um, and, and what you basically do is take the down off the leaves and it forms like a, it's almost foamy when it's gathered together. Okay. And gath it gathers together really easily. And so um, mugwort used to be called sailor's tobacco in, in English anyway. And that's because where, where sailors would go, they would find that the mugwort would um, be useful to make tinder for a fire. Mm -hmm. And so they would also smoke it because they didn't have any tobacco left. But they'd find it because it grows really well next to the sides of roads, things like that. And what the ancient Chinese found before um, before acupuncture, actually, in the, the Mawangdue tombs, they found that actually it was more moxibustion beforehand. Um, and so what would happen would be, say someone comes along, they've got some kind of injury, some kind of illness. The practitioner would bundle together in like a little cone shape bundle together the moxa and then place it on the skin and then set fire to it. And because it holds together so tightly, it would burn through onto a point. Um, and that's, uh, it's been largely refined over the times. Japanese moxibustion practice. It's very subtle, very, very small, minute. They call it a rice grain moxa. And it, it would just like, uh, you just burn it over the skin, catch it a little bit. There's some things that you see in Chinese moxibustion where uh, you see people with big scars where they burn right down to the skin um, and open wounds actually, which isn't, you know, it's not really too good in modern medical practice. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to see that. Don't send that off to your GP or your, or your doctor or something like that. Um, but we use different ways. Uh, there's one version, shame I haven't got any here um, in the house. It's like a stick, like a big cigar. Yeah. No over points. Another way, um, just you gather it up and place it on the end of a needle. And it basically warms through the needle, um, heats up the point, and then stimulates the effect. So uh, we get into Chinese medical principles there, um, like warming the yang, things like that. Um, cool. If you're really interested, you should check out Mox Africa. Okay. It's an amazing... Uh -huh charity over there in Africa that they're doing. I'll check it and then we can get a link on the on the video description as well. Sure. So the next thing I want to ask you is how how did you become interested in acupuncture in the first place? Was there a particular like trigger point in your life where you said I don't want to be a superhero. <laughs> I want to be kind of um, a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> different kind of superhero. Um, I was trained to be a chef actually. Uh, Back in, I traveled around Australia when I was 19. Um, 
and then decided to come back to the UK to train to be a chef as a good way to travel. Mm-hmm. And I was doing that and then realized it was kind of a job, a thing to do until I decided what I really wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, my life was pretty chaotic. If you've ever met a chef, they tend to live quite, you know, they're quite um, chaotic lives. Yeah. And it wasn't really working out for me. And I was started looking at different things and started reading some, I guess you'd say spiritual books, things which are about, you know, finding, finding your purpose and finding what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and then started reading this book called The Celestine Prophecy, which is a kind of an awful uh, new age kind of hippie book I see. That, that I wouldn't advise anyone to read really, but it was quite life changing for me. And what that talks about is how we understand the, uh, the energetics of interactions between two people, between people and plants, between our life experiences and how they all come together. So I started sort of looking into these things for myself and started becoming aware of all these experiences I, when I was a kid. Like my favorite book as a kid was Lord of the Rings. And my dad, I remember my dad reading that to me as a kid. And he would, uh, I, I remember specifically him talking about the character Aragorn, who was this nomad who wanders around. And then in, there's this one part in the book where Frodo gets stabbed. And Aragorn sends Samwise Gamgee off to pick up this herb called King's Foil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Puts it on the wound. And that was like this moment I remember as a kid just thinking that was really fascinating. Um, And then other things like my granddad had been a medic in the Second World War. And he used to pick comfrey. used to pick comfrey in the garden. Um, so if someone had an injury, you know, comfrey in, in English is called uh, one of the folk names for it is bone knit or knit bone mm-hmm. so it's used for um, fixing breakages and, and wounds that way and I was really close to him um, and then yeah so all of these things when I was a teenager I was really into martial arts and Bruce Lee movies and then through that and a friend of mine who we used to we'd just mess around in the garden doing different martial arts stuff found out about um, Dit Da Jiao which is a herbal formula used for treating trauma the martial art like uh, kung fu guys will use on their hands to heal their hands quicker Mm -hmm. and so all of that tied together and just was doing this meditation read this part of this book the celestine prophecy was doing this meditation one day and this word just popped up in my head of acupuncture and yeah i i looked online there was a course like in, in Manchester at the University of Salford. And uh, yes, signed up two, three weeks later. Uh, mm, yeah, four weeks later, I was at uni, like starting the course. It was like a so life. You were very determined. Yeah, it was one of those crazy moments in life, you know. It, it's when you actually find like something that you, you wouldn't consider as work. Mm-hmm. So, something that you enjoy doing and you can simultaneously make an income out of yeah exactly it's uh i guess you call it a vocation rather yeah. than a yeah, rather yeah, than yeah. a job and there's some passion behind it and it's really inspiring to get up every day and go and do that so yeah and so if someone wants to find out more about acupuncture what uh, resources would you recommend whether that's a website or a book or or even sure, yeah. um, so, I mean, there's some info on my website. If they want to check out my site, that's um, www.philiptrubshaw.com. Okay. And that's just intro to some of the things I do. Um, for In the UK, at least, um, we have the British Acupuncture Council. And now acupuncture in the UK is well regulated. We've got pretty much you know, some, of the top, some of the top standards in Europe. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, what's the website for that? Uh, www.acupuncture.org.uk, but I'm not sure sort of across Europe. There are, um, a few European, um, conglomerate organizations that, um, look over sort of acupuncture practice across Europe who are trying to standardize the practice so that acupuncture has got the same standards everywhere. Um, I'd have to look into that to find out in an email address. 
Yeah, I'll, um, put, I'll put the link for the uh, British acupuncture uh, uh, site and, and yours because I saw you, you, you're you also blogging about several things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm it would doing... be interesting for people to read. Yeah, a few things that I'm sort of looking at at the moment. Um, some men's health things, diet, seasonal eating, and lifestyle yeah. habits are coming up as well. Um you saying about uh, if people wanted to read more about acupuncture too. Um, if if someone wanted to know the very basics, the best book is called uh, The Web That Has No Weaver. Mm-hmm. That's by a guy called, a guy called uh, Ted Kapchuk. Okay. Who was, he was one of the first guys to go over from the West once the, uh, I think it was called the, the Red Curtain or something like that, or the Iron Curtain came up in, in China. Yeah, I see. Uh, Interesting. So yeah, we can put a link up to that as well if you want to read that. So um, you, you're um, interested in uh, traditional Chinese medicine started uh, o- over 10 years ago, you said? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you did the course in traditional Chinese medicine as well? So the way that acupuncture works, because the system of acupuncture I practice is traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture. All right. So what happens when you enroll in a TCM acupuncture course here in the UK is that you get the basic framework of the medical system. And that, yeah. And then on top of learning Western medicine as well. Um, But then that same system applies to the Chinese herbal medicine as well. Mm-hmm. So acupuncture theory and, and Chinese herbal medicine, traditional Chinese medicine theory, they all tie together. Um, so it's a really, that's why it's so good because you're just kind of adding and building to the skill set as you go forward. Really, That's a uh, great thing about England. I mean, it's, it's good that they've regulated it because that way, it's easier for people to find reliable sources of education on such matters. It's not the same in Greece. Not really. <laughs> a lot of things, a lot of practices are not recognized by the state. Mm-hmm. So you can find independent private uh, schools to do it. But then one thing is you cannot really get registered somewhere in the public sector. And the other thing is you really need to look which ones are reliable so that you know that your teachers are actually qualified. You need to do a lot of research because there is no public uh, credibility, you know, with that. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's great about um, England. So yeah. I, f- I find it fascinating to read books on uh, herbal medicine in general. So do you have any book recommendations regarding TCM? Um, the best place to go really is um, you've got this Chen and Chen, which is you know the the the, the basic materia medica and uh, formulas and strategy books. If you really wanted to look at the way that the herbs are used, mm-hmm. but you've got that and the combination of um, the combination of that and pharmacology, you know, it will come it will approach the herbs from both sides, so it would un- you would understand sort of from your own background in more sort of medical science base. Uh, so Chen and Chen would be, you have the Materia Medica and then you have the formulas and strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, Chen and Chen are the authors. Yeah. Um, and they're probably two of the easiest ones to access in terms of the way that the, the, the herbs are perceived and then how they're combined together into, um, into formulas for specific illnesses. Um, if you wanted to learn more theory, um, if you wanted to know more about sort of the the backgrounds of TCM theory, then um, Giovanni Masciosha. Okay. Um, he's kind of the, well, he was the, he was the, uh, the kind of force behind a lot of the, the translations and a lot of the textbooks that are used in colleges in the West. Now. Oh, I see. What's the, you, you, you had, you did have a massive book of, uh, recipes that you send me uh, one for myself yeah that that would be from that book that would be um let's see 
That would be the the Bensky Dan Bensky Materia Medica. Because that seems seem so organized, which is great for a person like me who's like um, half time or OCD. <laughs> you like to have everything nice and organized. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 great, you know, when I have a, like a proper a prescription essentially to make the stuff. Yeah, that um that formula was from an old edition of the Materia Medica by Dan Bensky. Um, there's a newer edition out now that's got way more clearer translations. And, you know, if, you, if you're if you a geek like me and like to look at where the sources were from sort of 1,500 years ago, it's got all of that kind of information in there. Oh, it's great. Um, there's a few others, but they're probably a bit too advanced unless someone was really already a Chinese herbalist. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I guess like in, in that case, if there if we have any viewers that are more advanced they can contact you through the through your website so that they can find more info yeah definitely uh, if they wanted to i also saw in your uh, posts as well as website that you're interested in taoism mm-hmm. and, and buddhism so tell us a bit more about that interest and uh, for a lot of people that actually may not know what taoism is a short definition sort of sure so um Taoism originates in uh china around about mm, 200 to 300 bc uh with a book called the Tao Te Ching, which i think is the most translated book after the bible in terms of the number of um, a number of versions that have been created um the the key symbol that everyone would associate with Taoism is the the Taiji, the yin yang symbol. Yeah. Um, so Taoism was a reactionary movement to the conventional Chinese philosophy at the time, um, which was Confucianism. Confucianism was all about ritual and about social conventions. Mm-hmm. Uh, those social conventions were really what built up Chinese society. And it made, it, it made sure that um, relationships were held out in the best way. Um, and so, for example, if we were interacting, I would treat you as I would want you to treat me if I was in your position. It's this basic, do unto others as you would do what would yes. have done. Yeah. And Confucianism was quite a strict script of that. Of, and then when these relationships were formed in a clear and concise way, then the world would become harmonious. And uh, Lao Tzu, who may have been a group of authors, may have been one guy who was a, uh, an old librarian, wrote this book, The Tao Te Ching, as a way to sort of... Mm, you could say almost give a different take on how to live life basically. And so that was more in the way of nature to let go of all of these um, rituals and all of these things that were so uptight and just to try and live in sync with uh, the world around us and recognizing that when we look inside ourselves, we see the mirror to the world in front of us. Um, And that's really the underlying idea behind Taoism is finding the way of nature and the most efficient way of of doing things as well at the same time um so that interest for me sort of developed around the time when i was uh first getting into martial arts when i was maybe 15 16 all right um and i started watching bruce lee films and if you ever watch a film like enter the dragon um, yeah. by Bruce Lee. There's yeah. some fairly uh, little um, sort of pop culture references to Buddhist and Taoist philosophy. Um, that, that then triggered an interest in me in understanding what means by this thing chi and what all these kind of meditative practices were basically. Um, so yeah, it's, that's almost been yeah, a, a fairly consistent in my life for around the past 20 years or so. Um, Buddhism kind of grew from that and started reading about Buddhism around about sort of 17, 18. Um, 
no way. So yeah, it's uh, and is your uh, close circle like family and friends following uh, the ideas and the philosophy behind Buddhism or Taoism? Family, no. Family, I'm kind of renegade. <laughs> renegade kind of black sheep of the family you might say um none of them have any connection to Taoism or herbal medicine or acupuncture or anything like that really um i think they wonder why i have ever decided to choose to go into that kind of thing um friends uh my friend when i was 16 yeah he we like can relate a lot over those things and have that kind of um yeah sort of that understanding from a deeper connection of of what Taoism and buddhism might might say and i've got some friends now um either from different social circles um who can appreciate what Taoism and buddhism are all about um and the acupuncture world as well because acupuncture is basically based on Taoism. yeah I see. But yeah, so yeah, there's no shortage of people who are into Taoism and Buddhism in my life. I, I guess you make new circles once you're into things. I mean, especially with, you know, either going to a particular center, uh, like a Buddhist center, or now social media nowadays, you, you meet new people. Yeah, it's very easy to connect with people through those things. Because I remember I happened to live next to Brighton Buddhist Center for three years yeah. we did we we moved on the same street so I, I said i'll check it out and then i found out they have a two month eight week uh, meditation course yeah i said sure I'll, I'll i'll join and then there was kind of a new circle of uh, acquaintances you know that some turned into friends through the center because when you meet someone on the street the fact the, that they wouldn't be the like it wouldn't be the first thing they mentioned that they're Buddhists or that they practice meditation. So it's hard to know. Yeah. I mean, I mean it could be your, your baker, you know, in, your, in the corner, uh, corner shop. Could be, you know, your taxi driver. So you, they, they don't discuss that thing openly because a lot of people feel that they may be judged. But then you yeah. create new circles. Yeah, there's even a phrase in one of the Buddhist scriptures about if you see the Buddha, see the Buddha walking down the street, kill him. So people <laughs> probably keep it quiet for that reason. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, yeah, exactly. And there's these small little open, doors open, don't they, all the time? You find yourself in places like I guess how we were introduced through Yanis. Like there's yeah, there's infinite connections that you can find through people. It's yeah, I find it so interesting because yesterday we had a, a chat with Yanis for uh, for his website, and I, I told him, you know, uh, tomorrow I have uh, I'm, I'm going to have a chat with Phil, and he's like, Oh, what about? And I said, You were gonna record, you know, um, for our websites, and it's like, It's interesting because I, 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 I felt that you're gonna uh, connect. You know, it's interesting because he, he just created a common Facebook conversation. He's like, you guys should talk <laughs> to each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then from there on, I started following your, uh, mainly your Instagram because you have a lot of stories. Yeah. Uh, I find them interesting. And I checked your website and the, the articles that you have on your blog now. And I said, okay, I started becoming more and more interesting. Yeah, it's... Um... It's great to just connect that way, isn't it? Like the yeah. connections of the world are just so so available all the time um, and just open so many little doors to us. Um, you never know. I was talking to someone just earlier on about, you know, when I was in Australia sort of 10, 15 years ago um, and, yeah, bumping into people I couldn't have known from home and end up working them on the, with people on the other side of the world. It's just crazy how things connect together like no one's that far apart so yeah. um so i think that's one of the things that buddhism and Taoism kind of taught me in a way actually yeah so another thing i wanted to ask you is um i know you're working at the center now uh, mm -hmm. and you're simultaneously learning all the time so what's a typical uh, day for you and if you have any morning or evening routines 
Um, I do usually. I'm a bit off at the moment because I've had a, I've had a, you know, sometimes life comes along and throws a stick in the path and trips you up. I've had one of those, so my routine is broken at the moment. Um, I, but usually my routine would be when I'm totally on the ball would be wake up. Uh, my alarm goes off 6.30 um, every day, even on the weekend. Um, I get up by 7, meditate. And then after meditation, have a green tea. And then usually it's exercise. Um, on a weekday before my clinic day, it's usually I just try and do like 20 minutes of either sort of stretching or high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, shower, um, sometimes cold shower. I'm taking a break from cold showering at the moment. So the water started getting really cold. You know. I, guess, uh, <laughs> I guess it's getting colder there. Yeah, I'm going to have to get used to that again when I'm back into it. Um, and then, then it will either be, it depends if I'm fasting or not. because I've been doing some fasting lately, but, um, usually I'll either have breakfast around about seven thirty ish whilst getting like my backpack put up, ready to go out to work and then start work around about nine thirty. on the weekend. I usually do after I've done my green tea, I'll go empty stomach and then I'll go and walk around the park for an hour mm -hmm. um, just sort of try and get my 10,000 steps in every day. Um, so that's my morning start up. And then I'll work clinic from 9.30 and go right the way through till 5, 6 o'clock. Um, and I don't really have an evening routine. At the moment, I've been working pretty late, which is a very non-Chinese medicine thing to be doing. You know, we're all taught that we should be relaxing more in the evening, but you know, when, you, when you're running your own clinic and you've got all the patients and you've got uh, you know, all of the, uh, the admin in the background, all of those things, so my evenings at the moment tend to be quite, quite busy, either catching up on cases, things like that. Um, yeah, that's my usual routine. Um, part of my, my mission going forward actually is to look at um, the Chinese medicine sort of lifestyle advice a bit more. Um, so that changes through the seasons. So I I do a bit really, you know, it just depends on what my schedule is like through the winter. But the Chinese medicine advice would almost be well because the sun goes down earlier, you should go to bed earlier, and because the sun comes up later, you should get up later. Um, it doesn't always work that way, you know. In England, in winter, we you'll know we have yeah, yeah, yeah. like five hours of daylight <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's 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 already like getting dark at 4 p.m so yeah it's, it's challenging <laughs> yeah so i can't i don't think i can bring myself to be 100 percent that committed to the winter routine but there's a few things just about how to preserve yourself through the winter like not doing too many outward things in winter it should be a time of reflection and and uh introspection ready for growth in the spring and i think those kind of practices they're, they're supposed to be long you know longevity giving practices so that's how my schedule is going to adapt over time but at the moment you know we're still just at the tail end of summer so getting up at seven and and being a bit more active that time of day is quite good for me i find it interesting what you said to um, like um sort of close yourself in the winter and then sort of bloom in the spring like a, like a flower. It's like, it seems like a floral, floral circle. Yeah, it's very much that way. The, the, the cycle of life could almost be seen as the growth of a, of a plant. You know, in spring, the, the, the seed that has been in, you know, you, the seed has to be planted in the ground yeah. in winter and it has to go into sort of stasis with the cold when it starts it, to warm up it builds stronger roots through the winter it's just we don't see it yeah exactly and then when and then it bursts through the ground in spring and then summer is the time when it's in full bloom yeah and and then this time is harvest time and then we have autumn where the leaves fall and then winter and the cycle repeats and that's the life cycle in chinese medicine on a day-to-day -day basis and on a Year, yearly basis and on a lifetime 
That's very interesting. I had never thought of the equivalency. Yes. So I suppose that especially in the center, you must have a ton of jars of different herbs. I wish. I wish <laughs> I don't. You know, I'd have I'd have pictures of my uh, my clinic is actually in a center where I'm not allowed to dispense herbs from. Oh, I see. Because I work in a building, um, it's half National Health Service and half um, half run by a social enterprise company. I and see. so because of the, the gray area there, I can't have a dispensary on the premises. I so see. I actually use a delivery service, you know, get the herbs sent in to the center and then people can collect them that way. So it's not as exciting as I wish. Um, Soon. Yeah, well, that's that's sort of down the line. That's what yeah. I'm aspiring to, you know. So at the moment, most of my work is very mental. I don't get a lot of hands-on unless, um, like at the moment, I've got someone who's coming with uh, hypermobility issues and a couple of people with injuries, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. And I'll make up topical formulas, like the one that I told you about. Yeah. Um, I'll make up things like that for them specially and uh, usually in a big jar uh, like a, a big like jam storage jar and then put the herbs in there and have uh, vodka prepare that for them and then um, just give it to them and they let it preserve at their house over a period of time um, yeah that's the most hands on what are the must have herbs that you you generally possess for your own personal use like the ones that you'll always have at home or at work in case you need them or you consume them daily okay so um i usually have i guess you call them trauma liniments mm -hmm. i'm quite accident prone there's a couple of years ago i got knocked off my bike by a pedestrian and if i hadn't oh. have had yeah a pedestrian walked out in front of me on the cycle home from clinic oh. and i did like a full-on swan lake ballet <laughs> ballet into the middle of the road and uh and yeah it it yeah my sh i thought i dislocated my shoulder i was in agony and i think it was the topical herbs um trauma liniment so dit dar jow is one there's a few that aren't supposed to be sold in the uk anymore uh jeng so i think it's called uh uh wong tu yik which is woodlock these are all formulated um topical liniments so i have those um could i explain the herbs and those to you because i know the chinese for them not the uh not the western names that's okay you can give the chinese names and then i can i can find the uh, if there are the botanical names or like latin names Maybe what we maybe what we could do is like put on uh, on the screen as well so people could see that might be a way of, of making it easier. Yeah. If I right, my topical formula um, that I'm making up lately has got a few different things in one. So I look at uh, I guess frankincense and myrrh you would know. Ruxiang, Mo Yao we call them in yeah. Chinese. A strong blood invigorators, but they also seem to help redevelop the the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, they would go into a topical formula. Um, Tao Ren Hong Kwa, there that's a safflower Hong Kwa. Mm -hmm. and Tao Ren is the uh, peach pit or apricot pit. Um, and the kernel. Yeah, the kernel from inside there, um, and then a combination of Angelica, Angelica Dangue is one. Uh, Chuan Xiong is a form of lovage uh, used to nourish the blood and circulate around. Um, there's a couple of other forms of curcumin, uh, Urdu, uh, Yujin, which are stronger versions of turmeric. Turmeric in Chinese medicine we call it Huang Jiang. Mm -hmm. One that can go in a in a in a um, topical formula as well. There's a couple of other things like a uh, pseudo ginseng. Mm -hmm. It's Sanchi, which is a it invigorates the blood but also stops bleeding at the same time, and that's okay. a really, really special herb. Um, that's one 
Um, it's really expensive. I think for a uh, hundred grams, it's like 50, 50 pounds or something like that. So probably 60 euros for a hundred grams. Um, that would go in there. Um, and then it really just depends on what the specific purpose is um, on the diagnosis. Um, if you want more warming herbs, you can put cinnamon in there, um, ginger, they will help. Um, some formulas will contain mulberry, mm-hmm. mulberry bark. Um, that's another one. But yeah, there, there are a few of the herbs that will go into a topical formula that I might use. Um, other things just around the house, um, I have turmeric. You know, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, it's good for pain. It's good for, you know, you can put it into food, um, cinnamon as well. Um, I've actually just got my foot soaking in some Epsom salts right now. Yeah. Uh, which... Your recent, uh, <laughs> recent miss up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Epsom salts would be Mang Shao in Chinese. Um, and that you, they're actually used more as like a, take them internally for uh, you drinking that to help clear the bowels. Yeah. Um, but we can't do that in the UK anymore because of regulation. So no one's allowed to prescribe internal minerals. You can't even pres- prescribe uh, salt in the UK. Yeah. Um, we, we do sell uh, in Greece as a supplement. Mm-hmm. I, I need to check whether the um, indications say internal use or not. There's a thin line between what's being done and what's being regulated uh, as uh, a use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we're not statute regulated here, so technically anyone could do anything, really. You know, someone could walk down the street tomorrow and decide to be a herbalist and do that, but it's, yeah, it's, you know, you don't want a, someone to get harmed and then it all blows up in, in the way, basically. Um, I'm just trying to think what else I have in the house. I like to keep things which are um, for acute cold and flu. All right. Um, we're, we're in the season for it. For yeah. Winter is coming. Yeah. <laughs> Just watch out for the White Walkers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so there's a couple of things I have. Basically, there's one that I get from a local supermarket, which is lime flower tea mm-hmm. um, with mints which I just start taking. If I start to get a sore throat, I'll start drinking that. That was actually from a, an ex-girlfriend of mine. Her mom's Turkish and they used okay. to recommend that all the time. So I just picked that up from them. Um, from a Chinese perspective, I tend to have a formula around called Yin Chao San. Yin Chao San is a, it's, it's a formula used for clearing you know, toxic heat from the, from the respiratory system. And it's got um, honeysuckle and forsythia, the two main, um, two main herbs in that. Uh, mm-hmm. Or one jinyanhua, honeysuckle flower, and the other one lian, lian chao. Um, so uh, if I get really bad with a cold, I don't tend to, but if I do, I've got that on standby. Um, we're in conference season. The last time I got a really bad cold was this time last year. We've got conference this weekend for the British Acupuncture Council. And on the day it started, I started coming down with this oh. really, really bad. I could feel it in my throat sore, and I thought, I'm going to just have terrible man flu. So I got lots of vitamin C, lime flower tea. I arrived at the conference, and there was one of the suppliers there. And they usually have these little packets of the formulas that they give away for free to people to try mm-hmm. And managed to track down the Sangju Yin formula. Uh, Sangju is a, a form of mulberry. It's a mulberry twig. So I managed to get some of this, take as much as I can in one go. So you can rely on your own supply. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and then managed to actually uh, sweat this this whole cold out overnight. Um, and yeah, gave it to everyone else and they didn't know how to get rid. So it was quite amusing. But uh, yeah, that was, um, yeah, Sang Ju Yin is the one to, to have around as well. 
A side note uh, on the on the Turkish that you said, because my my fiance is a Turkish Cypriot, so they use um, mint tea for any kind of trouble with your digestive yeah. system, like. If your bowels hurt, if your uh, tummy hurts, mint tea is a must. Like the, it's the it's the heal all herb <laughs> sort of. And it actually does help. I mean, I I know that in England in pharmacies they have um, mint extract concentrates and they dilute yeah. them and give them even to babies. But mm-hmm. you just need to be careful of the dilution because there used to be a there was a horrible accident several years ago where a, a pre-registration pharmacy didn't dilute it enough and they okay. gave a ridiculously high concentration to a baby. Uh, but it's it's widely used. I mean, mint tea and mint uh, extract is great. Yeah, it's in Chinese Materia Medica as well. Um, it's used one for soothing the throat and then if you have enough um, sort of i think larger doses maybe more than six sort of dry grams or equivalent of that it's used as a we call it a chi regulator okay and so the best way to describe chi regulation is when people get stuck in life we call it a there's this formula called easy uh easy free wanderer pill xiaoyuan mm-hmm. and um when people are a bit stuck then then their bowels get stuck and they don't have any direction and they they get a bit confused mentally they can't see beyond their uh, where they are in their life women with that would get menstrual difficulties and digestive complaints come up with it as well um and mint is one of the the things in that that helps to regulate um so yeah it's quite a common one in the chinese material america um yeah just in how it goes across so many like it spans such a broad yeah sure geographical area so if you had to um narrow it down to a mixture of herbs like a herbal elixir that is your favorite i guess it de- it would depend on the season and the occasion but what's the most consistent elixir that you uh, that you take um there's what okay there's there's one that i have called uh it's a derivative of a formula called Bujong Yichi Tang, which we'd use that as like a tonic formula to strengthen the body when you've exhausted. Um, and it contains astragalus. Ah, um, yeah. We call it Huang Chi. And then uh, it also contains uh, Sheng Ma, which is Kudzu, mm-hmm. and also Chai Hu, Bupolarium. And they're three key ingredients in that formula I just part of the reason why I like it is it well it gives you an uplift it's quite a a strong sort of tonifying strengthening formula but it's also um it's also got this a beautiful dynamic that that if you're a geek the way I am and like textbooks is basically it's about how we raise our energy up in the body and so one of the things that chinese herbs will do they'll look at how you you call them a carrier herb and certain plants will be used to move the prescription to different parts of the body and so interesting okay huang chi is seen to be this tonifying strengthening herb and then you use the sheng ma and the chai hu to like a almost like a helium balloon to carry it up to the head um to then boost someone's strength that's um that's how it's seen to work basically so that's like herbs that um determine the um bioavailability of of the rest of the ingredients i guess yeah in a sense yeah i'm i'm not sure how well that translates into sort of the western you know conventional scientific model yeah um but it's 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 interesting and because you'll use certain formulas like a, a root of a plant is seen to sink down Mm-hmm. So you might use a root of a plant to really like a stragglus would be a root of a plant, mm-hmm. and then you'd use the the leaves or the flowers to rise up essentially, and it's it yeah it's directing directing the formula in different different areas. So it's interesting, very interesting. 
And so you've read a lot uh, about um, different aspects of life, like herbalism, acupuncture, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, philosophy. So if you had to choose the three books that have mostly impacted your life, which uh, would they be? I mean, if I was to go purely off the things that have genuinely impacted my life, I'd say Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Even though it's nothing to do with herbalism, really. But just because that's the first book I remember ever being read to me in my life. The and elves were so, big on herbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly. They were definitely getting high on their own supply. <laughs> <laughs> um, Celestine Prophecy. I mean, that was a very influential book, even though... Uh, it's not something I'd you know recommend reading, but there's other things. The Tao Te Ching is um, is a very insightful book. Um, lots of translations, but it's it's difficult perhaps for a Westerner to understand it in a truest sense. I own about 15 or 16 copies of the same book because I just want to try and get as much of a grasp for what it's trying to say. Um, other than that, there's the Yi Jing. Yi Jing is a divination book, mm-hmm. um, which is the oldest book, I think, that is in publication still. Mm-hmm. Uh, its origin, origin is of 1600 BC. Um, and that was a book that was used essentially for um, divining military strategy on how to make the best choices for events in life. And I I like to apply that sometimes, um, give guidance, direction. Um, That book, I can't even explain, really. Um, I would recommend everyone to to read it. Um, That's sort of going back into Chinese antiquity. Um, Other than that, um, I like that book, uh, Where the Superior Man by David Ah, Dada. I've I've read that, and I remember you reading it, yeah. Um, oh yeah, because I put it on my Insta story, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've I've read that a few times over the past few years. It's one that I like to go back to. And it's one um, that the title is very misleading <laughs> because yeah, well, people will think it's uh, let's say a toxic masculinity book because the toxic masculinity as a term is in fashion nowadays. Yeah, but it's so so different, <laughs> way deeper than that. It should probably be, yeah. It should probably be the way of the empowered man, yeah, rather than the superior man. Probably. Um, I mean, the the superior man is the uh, the language used in the I Ching. Mm-hmm. The superior man takes this action because he's living in 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 touch with his true nature and therefore he acts in the the upright way almost you could say um but yeah i've I've gotten a lot into the the psychology side of things over the past sort of two three years there's that book um king warrior magician lover or something of that nature Mm -hmm. which is excuse me which is about jungian psychology and understanding shadow self and how to integrate our shadow um, into our daily consciousness so that we can, you know, live a full, fulfilling, meaningful life. Um, that's another one. There's, there's so many, actually. Uh, Mark Manson, anything by Mark Manson, I really enjoy. Um, whether it's his books or his, uh, or his articles. All right. Um, He's got, I really like his way of writing. Be quite matter of fact in his Sorry, way of writing. Could you repeat that? I really like. We lost, uh, we lost the connection a bit there. Oh. The last one. No problem. Um, anything by Mark Manson. He wrote that book, Models, mm-hmm. which is about sort of uh, the men's dating world, which is re- gives a really interesting perspective on how to live your purpose and how to live true to yourself. Um, but then he also had that book come out recently, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. 
I don't know that book. I saw it in uh, W. H. Smith on my last trip to England. Oh, cool. Yeah. Did you buy it? No, I, I you know, I'm, I'm always a bit uh, concerned with titles of books in the self-help section. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't even like the term self-help section. I think it's self-enhancement or improving, not help. Yeah, or sounds, self-development. Sounds, yeah, it sounds a bit uh, like you're in despair <laughs> with the self-help. But yeah, the uh, title was very, you know, interesting. But yeah, did you read it? So, so this one? Yeah, I read it a, a few months back now. And the, the, the concept I took most from it was uh, how to one of the problems why we we feel like we don't succeed in life is because we set ourselves inappropriate measures for success mm-hmm. given our circumstances and the, really the way to the way to measure success is by giving yourself good measure so you know for me in in terms of my herbal dispensary i can't see 500 people a week like someone could in china because yeah. I, I I work on my own. I you know I'm, there's finite resources that I have, and I need to sleep at some point. So I can't really me- measure my successes by those standards. But you know on a on a day to day basis, on a week by week basis, I'm seeing as much people as I can and and doing the best job I can. Then I I can measure my success that way far more accurately. Um, and there's, there's ways in which you can always set yourself up to failing by by almost building yourself barriers that are too tall. Um, and that's one of the key key concepts I found in that book. Um, yeah, that that and uh, models are good. Um, I think what else? I I have almost have too many that I I thought about that before. Um, most influential. Um, yeah, I've probably said too many already. <laughs> so, what's the next steps for you? Like, what plans do you have for the next couple of years or three years? In, um, term, in terms of, you know, it could be it could be like dispensary related or not. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got I've got a few plans I'm working on at the moment. Um, the first. Um, I'm I'm completing my MSc this year, so I've got sort of 12 months from now to complete my MSc, which is on psychopharmacology mm-hmm. of a category specific category of um, Chinese herbs to understand how the pharmacology gives us an interpretation understanding of the traditional concept of Shen in Chinese medical terms. Oh, the Shen being, yeah, the Shen being the spirit or you know, that which animates us, you know, we could get into very philosophical terms, you know, the anima and the animus and all of these kind of Jungian terms as well. Um, that's one of my interests. So that's going to be a big part of my life over the next 12 months. And then I'm currently just working on business development. I'm getting more into this digital marketing world at the moment. Mm-hmm. Started reading that book. Actually, that's another book I've been reading lately. Uh, Crush it by Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. Vaynerchuk. Yeah, um, just living your passion and how to turn that into into you know earning a living. So following that a bit at the moment and trying to build my practice up um, to get to the point where I'm you know booked up, fully booked a month in advance, essentially. Yeah, and then going forward. I've got an idea about a new dispensary, um, finding my own place with collaborators uh, somewhere, probably in Manchester. Uh, and then I've got a couple of ideas about how to start making the lives of new graduates easier when they've just come out of the acupuncture, the acupuncture college world and how to you know, give more opportunities to new graduates, basically. Um, that's sort of a long-term aim anyway. Um, they're my the professional goals over the next sort of two, three years. Um, and do you have some yeah. personal? Personal, um, I want to buy a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm, gonna, I'm having like a third third of life crisis, I think. <laughs> um, I want to travel more. Um, I've been working so hard at the Chinese medicine now for 10 years um, that I, I for, I've foregone some of my old aims, which was to see more of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to travel more. Even like Athens is on, on the list of places to visit. Um, I'd be happy to China. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. Um, um, but China, not been to China yet. Mm-hmm. Um, where else? Just so many places. Um, China's gonna be a long trip. I mean, you you need to spend some time there once you make it, I guess. Yeah, for China, I'd have I'd want to spend some time in a hospital, finding some observations to be able to do to be able to really see how they work over there. And for that, I've been advised I need a month. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, I'd want to go and travel. There's a few places like uh, Hangzhou, where they've got this huge lake and where some of the nicest green tea in the world comes from. And then you've got uh, Zhang Jiajie, which is, if you've ever seen that film Avatar? Yep. The Hanging Mountains of Avatar. That's a real place in China. Um, oh. And so, you know, that that'd be an amazing thing. And I, I've set myself a goal of climbing a really big mountain at some point in the next 10 years. Um, I don't know if that's going to be Everest, but something of that nature, maybe just Kilimanjaro. Um, but yeah, I want to go and do a feat of that kind of physical challenge. Physical. I read a book recently called uh, Into Thin Air by John Krokauer who wrote the film, the book about Into the Wild, if you know that. that I, I know film. I know Into the Wild, yeah, yeah. So Into Thin Air is the book about the 1996 Everest disaster, which is supposed to put everyone off the idea of climbing Mount Everest, and it would, really, unless you were crazy like me. <laughs> um, and it really inspired me to think, okay, I want to go and do something of that nature. Maybe not Everest, but... I like hiking anyway. Hiking is one of my one of my things that I do when I can walk um, and get out and doing some real real feat of physical challenge like that would be really great. So yeah, that's pretty much where I'm up to. I think but that's enough for the next two that's, three years. I think. Yeah, that's a lot of goals. That's good. That, that's why I guess you've been having some late nights. Mm-hmm. We have twenty four hours was- to achieve them. <laughs> You broke up a bit then, sorry. I uh, said, so yeah, you, you probably, that's why you have a lot of late nights. We all have 24 hours to achieve those goals. Yeah, exactly. So just have to keep on grinding. <laughs> so do you have a favorite quote? Um, I've got a couple. Um, one of my favorite is from a, an author of a guy called Robert Anton Wilson, mm-hmm. um, who I read in in uh, progressively over the years whose idea is all about consciousness change and understanding our maps of reality and uh, one of his phrases which comes also into that book seven habits of highly effective people and the map is not the territory mm-hmm. uh, and just that helps me to think about how everything is just you know that i've got a road map and there's always a new road map that you can you know, fine tune the map to make everything better um, and keep adapting everything. Um, understanding the maps for our reality is really important, you know, for our personal lives and for professional lives. To be sure that we know what, that we're really taking the right directions, I think. Um, and knowing that we can upgrade, get a new map if that's just necessary. And then there's another one by uh, my favorite, like, uh, my favorite philosopher is Alan Watts. Oh yeah, um, and he says this thing about what is it? Um, everything you see in the world around you is how you feel inside your head, and it's about how our perceptions create our reality, really. And yeah, that's what one thing that helps keep me going, you know, when the, when the nights are dark and, and cold, like knowing that you can choose any time you want to think in the way that you want, and that will make an impression on the world. 
and that will influence every action that we have to take. Yeah, definitely, because the psych is uh, su such a big part of life. Mm -hmm. like yeah, it, our our mental state affects our life so much more than we generally are taught to think. Yeah, definitely. Like you can, uh, you can, I can, like you can, as you said with the cold, you can choose to shiver <laughs> out in the cold, or you can um, sort of embrace it and say, okay, I'm, I'm heading home, I'm heading to a warm place. It just, you know, a few more minutes, and then I, I can, I can handle that. It's not that bad. Otherwise, you can be like complaining and thinking, oh my god, why, why did I step out of home today, <laughs> and like that. It's, yeah the temperature is the same <laughs> your perception changes exactly it's like um i've i had this decision that i've made in my life which is um anything that happens i'll make the best of it whatever it is like even like this past week where i've past few weeks where i've had this like this uh health problem yeah and so well how do i turn that around i've actually turned that around that i'm now eating like I was healthy before I ate really healthy, mm -hmm. but I've just upgraded my health, like an extra, an extra bit that I, you know, I didn't think I needed to, but yeah, I'm even healthier now. Um, and it's, it's taught me a lot actually about things that I, you know, ways I've been choosing to live my life that needed to be upgraded. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's actually turning that into a, a, a better experience. Learning experience, yeah, it's great. You, you, chose, you chose to um, enhance yourself rather than, uh, you know, take yourself down with the yeah, exactly. health issue. It's been a great, uh, great chat. Uh, and I would like to ask you where could people find uh, more about you. You mentioned your website, which is www.philiptrapshow. Is the full name? Yeah, philiptrapshow.com. Uh, that's okay. my website. And then, go on, sorry. And and then you've got uh, a, a page on Facebook. Yeah, there's the Facebook uh, business page, which is just facebook.com slash philiptrapshow. Mm -hmm. And then I've got... Uh, my Instagram page, which is a bit more personal, less business. If you want to see what I'm up to on a Friday afternoon on the way home from work, that's if they're interested in that. Um, that's uh, Phil Trubshaw underscore Aki. Mm -hmm. And um, on Twitter, it's Phil Trubshaw, uh, I think, Ak underscore Ak. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the Aki on Twitter. Um, but yeah, they're a place they can find me for my regular updates and everything. I, I do recommend uh, people to follow you on Instagram, apart from the other social media as well, because I, I like your stories. Cool. Thanks, Ben. I'll keep them yeah. going. <laughs> Especially those um, morning walks in the park. Yeah. You have some good insights there. And I mean, you, you especially recently with uh, uh, health troubles, you've shared a lot of... Um, medical material there what you've been doing uh how how you approach it so it it may not be directly business related but it, it is essentially purpose related yeah i think it's useful i've got a lot of friends who are vegan for example and i've been vegan for five years and you know six years and thinking oh i'm being really healthy and then knowing finding out that actually like veganism could have been responsible for me like with what the illness I've had the past few weeks that that could have influenced it. It's really useful to know. And if anyone gets benefit from that, that's great. I, it's more just about I'm having fun putting things yeah. on Instagram really. And you know, if I can share something that's useful at the same time, that's great. All right. So I'll link uh, all the details where people can find you on the description of the video. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and looking forward to our next chat. Yeah, likewise. Thanks Thank, you very, Thank you very much. Thank you.